tier one. Social engineering. This can be summarized in a sentence. It's easier to fool a person than to fool a machine. Sounds sophisticated, but you've definitely seen these. In the form of fake download buttons, completely real girls in your area, the millionth visitor, the whole enable notifications or calendar to continue, or phishing. This last one is often seen as cloned websites, where a malicious actor will ask for your data, and chances are that you're giving it to them. I mean, a website is very easy to clone, just a couple of clicks and you'll clone the entire layout of a legitimate page or email. In some cases, they even add fake reviews and things like that. I usually notice it's fake because the people they put there look like from a stuck photo session. They have generic names, all the reviews are 5 stars, and never ever commit any typos, or it's clearly a badly translated comment that is not realistic. To this, a countdown could be added to make the victim feel pressure in order to give in and fall into the scam. And even the whole Nigerian prince thing could fall into this category, being predecessor of more complex scams. And speaking about that, social media scams. Social media is a great tool, when used correctly, which most people don't do. I mean, after all, you're watching this video, right? So it is not surprising that due to the abstraction and scale that social media provides, it's becoming the best place to scam people. For example, this is the one that I have personally encountered. I've blocked around 10 numbers at this point, and two more while making this video, asking me via WhatsApp that I hate using <laughs> if I want to earn money easily by giving likes on YouTube. And I just replied, I didn't know they spoke my language in Bangladesh. Seriously, that did actually happen. Be wary of any phone number from another country, just anybody that you don't know and send you a message. Some countries have worse regulations and they can get away with it easily. I'm pretty sure most of these are even bots because they talk to me first and that is not something that happens to me. Moving on to a weirdly nostalgic one, we have Facebook scams in the form of chains. You have to remember one of these, like, when your friend sends you a message that, between a lot of typos, told the story of a dead girl, and you had to share it because if you didn't, you died. <laughs> Quizzes were also very popular back then. You visit the link, and it's a phishing site. Once they have your account, they keep sending these to your friends, and so on. Fortunately, even if I was naive, I was so naive that I made a typo, and the phishing site uploaded that one. I never got hacked by pure accident. Now you know, if you see a phishing scam, just put a random password. They'll always let you in or show a site error. They can't correct you because they don't actually know your password. Scams in common while not as bad as they used to be, there are still some out there, often bypassing the filter by stealing a real person's comment, adding a telegram number with a girl, or just straight up impersonating creators. If you see one of these in my comments, offering money and things like that, don't trust them. I don't use telegram because who would I talk to and I'm broke, so it doesn't make any sense. There are some that have dissipated, but you never know. I'm talking about those sponsor scams. Someone sends a sponsor offer to the creator, attaching a very suspicious, definitely real docx, pdf file or something similar, and when they open it, it was actually an executable, or lately, a windows screensaver scr file. Most people don't use these anymore, but because they're pretty much executable programs, they can go under the radar easier. Windows does not help you in this regard at all. File extensions are hidden by default because they're just too complex for users to understand, and executable files are executable automatically by just giving them the right extension, making it the perfect formula that allows them to steal the cookies of your browser session, bypassing the need to even have to steal a password, and 2FA in many cases. This is when the attacker steals the channel, changes the password and details about it, and they always post an Elon Musk crypto scam livestream, even at midnight or whenever they think creators could be sleeping to prevent them from noticing. This has happened to many big channels, even ones like Linus Tech Tips. Now you know that if you see a crypto scam on my channel, it's not me. And by the way, there are websites like Scam Advisor or Trustpilot that compile multiple scams and you can use them to check the legitimacy of a website. You can also check where a picture is coming from with a reverse image search. Hacking 
We're just going to say hacker to refer to a malicious one, sometimes also called a cracker. You've seen the classic hacking portrayal, a person that never commits any mistakes and just types random buzzwords to a terminal, saying I'm in. Well, in reality, it's something way more boring, like a guy from Russia uploading a file, you download it, realize it was not what you were looking for, and delete it, only to never know you got a Trojan. Mr. Robot is one of those few ones that have a somewhat realistic representation. Now that's not saying that various mod attackers don't exist. There are a lot of hacking groups like the Decentralized Anonymous being the first thing that probably comes to your mind or lately Lapsus has been very popular, known for hacking Samsung, Microsoft, Uber and other companies. You probably have heard even of the user Teapot Uber Hacker, believed to have been associated with that group. He was the one that leaked GTA 6 footage and he was 17. Did it using a phone and an Amazon Fire Stick. But on the other side, there are technology prodigies that use their knowledge for other causes, aside from playing Doom on a pregnancy test. That's when the whole hacking hats thing comes up. Don't take it too seriously, but in general, flat hat hackers are the ones willing to do anything for money or personal benefits. White hats try to find vulnerabilities and report them to the owner, often claiming a monetary reward or even being offered a job. But you also have the gray hat who seem to follow their own moral code. They can make a vulnerability public instead of privately reporting it as a way of showing how dangerous it can be. There's also the so-called script kitties that are often younger people that want to get into cyber security, which is not bad, but they tend to do it without learning the basics first, just by malware, often being toxic, immature, and creating problems they don't really know how to solve. There are more, but honestly, I think they could all just boil down to these. If you think I missed something, let me know with a comment. Passwords Yes, I know what you're thinking. Passwords. Really? But just trust me. Okay, we know that a password is a combination of characters to provide a way of verifying you're the person you say to be. In the best case scenario, you would have a long password with uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters unique for every single account you use, and you would remember to change them periodically because it's useless to have a great password if you repeat it everywhere. But nobody does that, and in case you're one of those people, you should look on have I been pawned or owned if it has already been leaked. You'll probably even use one of these common passwords you're seeing right now, and if you do, please love yourself and change it. This is when it comes in handy to prefer using the term passphrase, because believe it or not, you shouldn't underestimate the psychological power of changing a word. Like this XKCD comic says, making your password something like troubadour and just replacing some of the letters with numbers is awful to remember and easy to crack, but a phrase like correct horse battery staple is way harder to guess but easy to remember. With every character you add to your password, the time needed to brute force it increases exponentially and it's way better if you don't include anything related to you, for example, a date, something you like or dislike. Now even with passphrases, you won't remember all of them and you likely shouldn't. That's what password managers are for. They take care of storing your passwords, creating them, typing them for you. Your browser or big tech account probably has one already. Ready. But honestly, I would only recommend Bitwarden, and no, it's not a sponsor. They are open source, have a great license, support basically all operating systems and browsers. It's even on FDroid, and you can self host it. KeePass is also great, but not as convenient for most people because it's only local. Two factor authentication, or 2FA, it's another security measure you have to validate in case your email and password get leaked. You see this often in the form of SMS codes that you shouldn't use as they're unencrypted and somebody could just intercept it and use it. Or notifications like the ones Android phones use, but I would also not recommend this. Even if they're handy just pressing a button accepting the request, they're subject to what's called a fatigue attack. Basically someone sends multiple requests hoping you misclick, get confused or tired of so many notifications and accept it to shut them up, giving that person access to your account. Keep in mind I'm not a cybersecurity guru by any means. 
always do your research, but I would only recommend you to use TOTP, that stands for Time-Based One-Time Password. It's just a unique, secure code that expires in a couple of seconds and you copy and paste, works on multiple devices and even offline. It's a universal standard, so you could use something like Google Authenticator Ages for an open source Android alternative or Authenticator for Linux. Some password managers also take care of this. The idea is to make a password less, likely even email less future. With passkeys, you wouldn't even have to make an email or password because if you think about it, the only reason we still use email is because all accounts require one. Quoting the passkey.org website, you authenticate by using something you know, like a pen, something you have, like a physical security key, or one of those security modules embedded on your phone or PC you never knew you had, and something you are, like a fingerprint or your face. All of this enables multi-factor authentication that is very secure and in practice, you don't even need to think about it. Just use your fingerprint and that's it. Of course, it's not perfect, as the implementation is early and varies, but with Apple, Google, Amazon and more big tech companies supporting it, I am hopeful that the adoption could be growing fast, even though we would have a period of transition where both would coexist, but the objective is to replace passwords eventually. This process could be less jarring thanks to password managers. VPNs for those that don't know what an IP address is, it's pretty simple. It's like online shopping. You'll never get your package if you don't have an address, and you can't send a package if you don't have an address to send to. Your house has a single, unique in the world public IP, or at least in the best case scenario. A virtual private network or VPN takes care of disguising that public IP to wherever one of their servers is located at. And that's when you have the side effect of being able to access content from other countries countries and preventing tracking, to a degree. Because a VPN is useless if you log into the same accounts from your home IP, then the VPN's IP or post everything about yourself online, at least when it comes to privacy. There are some legitimate uses for VPNs, like playing peer-to-peer -peer games without your approximate address being leaked. Right GTA Online? Yes, public IPs can give away your location, but it's not directly, and because most of them now group entire neighborhoods, it's possibly not even a very accurate one, just your city. I mean, still near enough for you to not want to reveal it, but even then, you could still be tracked by many other means. IPs now grouping big areas instead of single houses has also the side effect of not being able to expose your Minecraft, Nextcloud server, or website to the internet. This is when you could use a VPN like WireGuard or Tailscale to disguise your IP as if you were at home all the time like me, accessing your stuff from anywhere, protecting your traffic from public Wi-Fi networks. As much as YouTubers with VPN sponsors would like to tell you, they don't make you untraceable. And way less if it's a sketchy, free VPN that in most cases sells your data and slows your network down. I could have just thrown in a VPN sponsors from offers I've gotten, but honestly it just doesn't feel that right. If I get sponsored, it'll be something I could unironically see myself using and one with great reputation. Into viruses. An antivirus is a type of virus. <laughs> Fine, seriously. It is a piece of software designed to protect you from malware, constantly scanning files in the background, preventing some executables from running, and blocking some network connections. The reason why I made this super funny joke of why some consider antiviruses to be malware themselves is because they tend to slow computers down considerably. Most retail PCs come with one pre-installed and they're hard to remove for the average user, depending on the product, pricing, end point of view, they could fit into the category of knackware because it keeps begging for the user to pay the subscription, spyware because it keeps scanning user files, having some scandals because of this, and just being freemium, the absolute sin, having trials and complete features and things like that. Now that is not saying they don't help at all, but depending on your use case, you probably don't need one. That is, if you're an experienced user that has no trouble distinguishing scams, does not 
not download suspicious files and has good security measures. I mean, Windows already comes with Defender pre-installed and despite the memes, it is actually one of the more decent ones out there. It does block some malware and it does not yell at you begging for a subscription, that's Windows, but at least there are not two of them. Probably your grandma does need an antivirus, but just Defender in my opinion. And this is where the theory comes, stating that some antivirus companies could be the ones to create malware themselves. And I can see the argument, but I doubt that's the case, because I don't think you need to make complex malware in order for people to get infected. And you can always still profit off of users by selling their info, right Avast? There are some antiviruses that don't even pretend anymore and are straight up scareware, like Win Antivirus Pro, showing alerts to make the user think they have viruses or some made up things too advanced for the free version, getting them to pay without removing the true virus. But there are two antiviruses that I can see myself using. The first one is ClamAV, totally open source, also available for Unix systems. And VirusTotal, not running in the background, it's just a website. You can drag and drop files you're suspicious of or copy and paste links you think could have a scam or malware and see the report without an account. Even though, keep in mind that many viruses come in unnecessarily heavy sizes without real content. For example, a Word file of 800 megabytes in order to reach the limit and avoid being scanned. And also, whenever you buy a new pre-built laptop or PC, don't even let it boot, just make a clean install of the OS of your choice. The retail versions of Windows usually come with a lot of bloatware pre-installed. The ISOs do too, but it's way less. Shoulder surfing. This is a technique used to obtain personal information by looking over the shoulder of someone directly to whatever they're interacting with. It's pretty much like when you're on the subway and the guy behind you is really interested in knowing who cheated on your friend, but in this case, it's worse because they are also trying to guess and remember your sensitive information. Many people still use patterns, yes, even in 2024. The issue is that they only have so many combinations. You have nine dots, basically the only variable being the order because you cannot repeat it, leading to around 389,000 possible combinations in the best case scenario. It's a lot for a human, yes, but nothing a simple brute force attack couldn't break. Pins are slightly better because they also introduce the factor of being able to repeat numbers, but none of that matters if you're using a common pin, and most people do, so if you're using one of these or your birthday, change it. Somebody with experience would be able to get your pattern pretty quickly because the numbers have a fixed position. In more recent Android updates, you can choose to hide your pin, replacing the numbers revealed with random shapes, but it's still not great. Some Android forks and skins let you scramble the position of the pin pad whenever you lock your phone, and it decreases the chances of a successful shoulder attack. And while most people just fingerprint or face unlock their phones, when rebooting or whenever the biometrics fail, you'll have no other choice but to use your pin. So it's better to just choose a password. Even if it's only numbers, the sole fact of making it a password could increase the variable significantly, adding lowercase, uppercase, numbers, and special characters, which by then, your phone is likely going to get locked or you'll notice. In the best case scenario, you would use something like a passphrase, but most people won't do that because it'll get annoying. You can always get one of those privacy screen protectors, but the availability depends on your model and it could affect its color accuracy, so that's up to you. Kali Linux Operating systems like Kali Linux are focused on cybersecurity and penetration testing, including a suite of multiple applications related to this field. In fact, there is even a mobile version of Kali called Kali NetHunter and NetHunter Pro. NetHunter is a fork of AOSP with some interesting tools pre-installed. NetHunter Pro is not the same thing. It's a full Kali Linux build optimized for phones, apparently running Fosh as the DE. I would try any of these, but the amount of devices supported is very small, as expected with most alternative mobile OSs. I'm still waiting the day I can try a Linux phone. However, it usually has some bad reputation. Not because it's not good, but because of the people that use it, or more like misuse it. It's common to see kids playing, pretending to be hackers because it's the cool thing, dude. But in reality, what it seems most of these kids go through, it's them managing to install the OS, which previously 
Hopefully you shouldn't do, as the root account was the only one there by default, and most of them didn't know how to create a regular user account, and many people tend to troll them on the internet with dangerous commands, leading them to break their entire OS, and the worst thing is that most of the times, you don't even need to install Kali on bare metal, just use a VM or install these packages on any other Linux distro, Kali just provides convenience most of the times. Now I don't think we should shame them, we should probably just head them in the right direction instead, teaching them how to protect themselves, instead of how to attack other people, I mean after all, it's not legal. Tier 2 Spyware this is a type of malware that collects personal information about you. It could be to sell you personalized ads, to steal your banking information, username, or password. Some of these come in the form of keyloggers, and as the name implies, they keep storing and sending your keystrokes to the attacker, knowing indirectly your accounts, passwords, messages you typed, applications you opened. It could be very sensitive information. Signs of having spyware could be a device that is running slowly. When it previously didn't used to, having worse battery life and running out of space quicker than usual, as well as crashes. Examples of popular spyware are the following, Dark Hotel, with the first reports believed to be from 2014 in South Korea, it infiltrated itself into the often insecure hotel Wi-Fi networks, hoping to target company executives. They faked certificates, asking to download a fake software update that, once installed, steals information like passwords and other company confidential data. A more recent example is Ghostrat, with the last part standing for Remote Administration Tool, that attacked in 2021 the Android gaming emulator Nox Player for Windows and Mac, allowing them to access your device remotely, including the camera and microphone. There are many other examples, like Microsoft Windows, but we still have more topics to cover. <laughs> Adware to some, it could also be classified under spyware, because adware steals information and also shows more advertisements based on that information. I have a relative that got one of these and I can tell you that it is often even more aggressive than the average YouTube ads, and that's saying something. The classic example of adware is this. Your 9-year-old self goes and downloads CCleaner that can allegedly turn your netbook into a beast, because deleting garbage files is fixing core flaws this almost 40 year old operating system still has, but you didn't notice that the installer had a cleverly placed checkbox enabled by default. When this is the 20th installer you have to deal with, you leave everything by default and just spam next, unknowingly agreeing to install this ask toolbar thing that hijacks your search engine, gives you awful search results, and shows a lot of sketchy ads. You try to remove it, but it's not that easy being often protected by another add-on. And we can't forget about Bunsy Buddy, a program disguised as a virtual assistant in the form of a purple monkey that once installed, will ask for personal data, charge you for unlocking things like more songs, yes, because it sings, and it will show a lot of ads, overriding the browser store page. Software cracks are often viruses. Yes, I'm sorry to inform you that your Photoshop crack is very likely malware. Same for many other cracked or modded applications like WhatsApp Gold, one that is known for promising a lot of features a billion dollar corporation's messaging app should have had since 10 years ago, like themes, support for larger files, downloading statuses, and things like that. Keep in mind that WhatsApp can always ban you as it is a modded client, and most of the advantages have been finally introduced with some minor exceptions. Crypto jacking. You've definitely heard of cryptocurrencies. Summarized, one of the key points they have is that they're decentralized, and in order to verify a transaction, some computer around the world needs to solve a complex mathematical puzzle requiring significant power consumption and resource usage, and the first one to solve it gets paid with that cryptocurrency. Depending on how much shit is worth at that moment, it could be a lot of money. Crypto jacking is when you take advantage of 
monsters and use computers from third parties, gathering the power of all of them and using them to mine cryptos. And in some cases, you don't even need to download malware as many websites use the now dead JavaScript API with the name of CoinHive that let them mine Monero. It was presented even as an alternative for CAPTCHA without bothering the user. You know, just draining their battery to generate revenue for the website. While CoinHive is dead, the crypto jacking phenomenon is still pretty much relevant to this day. Computer Worms a computer worm is one of those programs capable of spreading through networks, file sharing, external drives, and social media. Now, keep in mind that not all info is perfectly accurate, and most of these nowadays could fit into multiple categories. It is believed that the creeper worm was the first computer virus to ever exist. Created by Bob Thomas, it just had the objective of knowing if the program could move between 10x computers through the ARPANET, later modified by Ray Tomlinson to also self-replicate, showing just one message, I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. Ray also made the first antivirus called Reaper, and as you can imply, it removed creeper. The first internet worm, however, seems to be the Morris worm, created by the 23-year-old student Robert Tappan Morris as a prank that spread through Unix systems used by Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, Berkeley, and even NASA. A bug caused overload in the computers, rendering them useless, with damages of up to $10 million, and being the first person convicted of one of these types of crimes in the US. But he didn't go to jail, he just had to pay a fine, be under probation, and complete 400 hours of community service. But finally, a more recent and popular example is I Love You, or the Love Letter Worm. What do you feel when I I said that. Disgusted, right? But let's say that you're a person in the 2000s and you get this email coming from your school or work crush just with a subject saying the most dubious and infamous phrase in history. The description reads, kindly check the attached love letter coming from me and a love letter for you txt attachment. Now that's when you'd feel intrigued instead, at least, leading you to open the file that a worm corrupts your files and sends the same message to all your contacts. You could say that people were naive, and yes, but all of that was almost 24 years ago. You might think that people from these days cannot fall into this specific worm, but the essence is the same, a data file that's actually inexecutable. Seriously, Microsoft, how hard is an executable permission switch or pop-up? I forgot tech is not there yet. Malicious macros. I told you about executables with hidden permissions, but there are some files that are actually what they claim to be, like a docx file. This is something that happens more often than what you think, and it can be pretty dangerous. If you don't know what a macro is, in this case it is a program you can make yourself to help you automate actions in the Microsoft Office suite. You can write them in Visual Basic, and they are not necessarily malicious, but I guess most people don't know about them, not having proper protection until recently, and that's why they are a great method of infection. An example of this is the malware Emoted, a trojan that spread in 2020 via emails containing a Word document as an attachment. Once opened, Word will use read-only mode that disables macros and editing. The document contains a fake pop-up of sorts, trying to get the user to enable the previously mentioned features, and if the user does so, it runs the macro that installs stores the TrickBot Trojan, capable of stealing passwords, cookies, sending spam, and it spreads through your network. If you look closely at the pop-up, you will notice pretty obvious grammatical mistakes, like the file was created on iOS device. Microsoft and Apple would never spell it with an uppercase I, and also click enable edition. That sounds weird. I know it's a little ironic coming from me, but come on, I'm not the one making malware with typos. Also, 
so the office logo is misaligned by 2 pixels vertically, and a real window would very likely not have asymmetrical padding being closer to the upper left corner. Yes, I literally measured it. No, I haven't gone out in a week. How do you know? Even though there is an updated template looking more like this, nicknamed Red Dawn, it fixes most of the grammatical mistakes, but not the padding mistakes. Even if Microsoft has patched some macros in 2022, seems to be only for Office 2013 and newer. There is probably no need for a macro to be bundled with an online word file, so I would not trust them. Also, LibreOffice and probably some other alternatives do support macros, so some malware made for MS Office could work to a degree in other operating systems. But there's also this malicious LibreOffice draw file by the name of badbunny.odg. It runs a macro compatible with macOS and Linux that displays, hey, username, you like my bad bunny. Attaching an image below of a man dressed as a rabbit doing, predictably, rabbit things but involving a woman. It seems to be more of a shock prank or proof of concept that could have been way worse, but don't look it up please. Like, I really had to search in places I'm not proud of to find this information. Ransomware. As the name implies, when it infects your computer, it behaves like a ransom, encrypting the whole operating system and any other plugged external drives too, asking for money in order to give you a key to decrypt your files and recover them. There is no way around it in most cases. It doesn't matter if you successfully remove the malware itself because the data will still be inaccessible if there is no decryption tool. Booting up another live OS to bypass it or taking out the drive physically still does not help, because even if you copy the files, they'll be unreadable. You could pay to get the key, but even then, they could still just refuse to give it to you. After all, you don't even know who they are because the payment is via some cryptocurrency, and due to its nature, it's very hard to track down. The most popular example is the one you're seeing right now, called WannaCry. It exploited a vulnerability on Windows because of course it's Windows, called Eternal Blue allegedly made by the NSA. Now, Microsoft did release a patch one month before the widespread attack, but most people don't want to update. I understand Windows Update sucks, but losing everything sucks even more. They demanded $300 worth of Bitcoin, increasing it later to $600. You only had three days to pay the ransom, or your files would be shredded. And it was even worse because the malware had a flaw where, even if you paid, there was no way for them to know what computer paid and which one didn't, causing around $4 billion in damages and losses. WannaCry does not work as of now. It had a very likely accidental kill switch that nobody knows precisely what it was for, but it could reinforce the theory that it was unfinished. It checked if a really long, bogus domain existed, and because nobody had it, the malware would continue to run. But an ex-Blad had hacker by the name of of Marcus Hutchins, while reverse engineering the ransomware, noticed this weird behavior, buying the domain for $10 and activating the kill switch that stopped copies of the malware from executing all around the world, likely saving millions of computers in the process, even though he was arrested and sentenced later to one year of supervised release, as he helped to make the bank in malware Kronos years before. Tells you that you probably shouldn't see people in black and white. Now, while those original WannaCry copies don't work anymore thanks to the domain kill switch, this one and an updated version without that flaw and other ransomware attacks are still very present. Some not only encrypt the data but also leak it. The best way to protect yourself against something like this is prevention. Make regular backups to an external drive and unplug it. Avoid downloading suspicious files and always have your OS to the latest version. Tier 3 Threat Model 
As much as we hate to admit it, we're never going to be perfectly private and secure, and the more you seem to improve these aspects, you stand out more, but also the less convenient it will very likely be for you. So a threat model helps you to decide who it even is that you're trying to hide your information and secure your data from. There is not a universal method, but by starting to brainstorm with questions like, what are my priorities? Is it a government, individual bad actors, companies? For example, if you're trying to hide from Google, you could drop Android entirely, Chromium and YouTube, and the many hundreds of things they own, even indirectly, with things like captchas, signing with Google, Firebase, that probably applications you didn't even know used, and so on. But it wouldn't be as convenient because you would lose access to Google Maps and my channel, which is probably for the best. But even doing this, you could be subject to an attack or leak information, but to another company. And running tour every day when they still know your real name and address is not going to help. It's all about balancing priorities and sacrifices. You could do small steps, like checking this privacytest.org chart, comparing all browsers and switching to a better one, using temporary email, downloading your Google Takeout data, disabling whatever you don't need, and deleting unnecessary accounts. I would recommend your channels like TechLore, Eric Murphy, and The Linux Experiment. Again, don't blindly trust what I or everyone else says. The cybersecurity community, or just tech community in general, is very prone to gatekeeping and things like that. And I know there's always going to be this smart guy that says, but I have nothing to hide. In that case, can you give me your phone unlocked for a second? Gaming hacks. One of the biggest attacks was the 2011 PlayStation Network breach, starting when Sony removed Author OS, a feature letting you install Linux on PS2s and 3s, and it was totally official. Even the US Air Force used this feature to create a supercomputer. The removal bothered many modders, one of them was George Hotz, that you might know as that 17-year-old, to be the first person to hack an iPhone into accepting other carriers. In 2010, he managed to hack a PlayStation 3 by getting access to the encryption keys that could allow users to flash anything they wanted to the console, like Homebrew. That it's a modification that can make consoles do things they were not intended for, like backing up saves, installing emulators, and sideloading games. And the latter is the one Sony had issue with, filing a restriction order against him, who had already added protections in order to stop people from using the jailbreak to run external, unauthorized games. Sony eventually dropped the case, but they had already crossed the line, as Anonymous were angry and launched a DDoS attack to the PlayStation Network, forcing Sony to shut it down for 23 days until they stopped, followed by another hacking group with the name of Lulzik that leaked the banking and personal information of around 77 million PlayStation users. To this day, people still mod around their PlayStations and install Linux on them, because it's just a game you can't win, it's a matter of time, but some of them use these security security flaws in consoles and games in order to cheat, like in GTA Online. This game still uses peer-to-peer -peer connections, making it very insecure. A modder can always get your IP easily, find out your country, and spawn enough items for the game or your computer to crash. But it's understandable because Rockstar barely earns any money from it. Some gamers are also being subject to scams, where they ask for personal information or to download malware in order to get money in Fortnite or whatever game is trending. But it could be even worse because in some cases, the own anti-cheat systems can be malware more than they already are. Like in 2013, when an anti-cheat system made by the Esports Entertainment Association was used by one of the developers themselves to mine crypto on the test users' computers. What happens to deleted files? We know that moving a file to the trash can does not delete it. It's more of a prevention measure in case you removed something you did not intend to, being able to restore it inside of the usually 30 days window. But even if you delete files from the trash can, these could still be there in some way. When you do it, the operating system marks that part in the disk as something that can be replaced by other content. It depends a lot, but chances are that that specific thing you removed never gets overwritten 
written by another file, so the data remains there. It could be partially or completely available still. That's when programs like Recuva can still recover your files. If you don't want this to happen, you can use something like File Shredder or Bleachbit. This is an open source Linux and Windows system cleaner. It can help you to shred your files, which means directly overriding that part of the disk, making it very unlikely to be recovered. Even then, most file managers in most operating systems offer image, audio, and video thumbnails by default. To avoid recreating them, that could be unnecessarily demanding according to the amount of files you have, usually storing a low-risk copy of that picture inside of another system directory. In Linux, it's under the doc cache folder, so you could take a look there every once in a while. Also, assume that everything you upload to the internet is always going to remain there. If you have this mindset, it's less likely that you will upload something that you will later regret. Trojans Getting their name as a reference to the Trojan horse story, this is a type of malicious program that disguises itself as a legitimate one, which is the system file, to avoid detection. While running in the background, they can download files from the internet, steal accounts, some phone Trojans can send text messages that are often charged to the user. Animal is considered to be the first computer Trojan. Released back in 1975, it was just a game that asked 20 questions to guess the animal you're thinking of. It spread itself across the network without doing anything really harmful. It was back when most of the malware was a joke or to show off the skills of the developer. One of the most popular examples is the Mems Trojan, getting its name from, well, memes, and created by the user Lurek. It is not necessarily made with bad intentions, but more as a proof of concept for a video. Still, it can be pretty dangerous, so if you plan on running it, do it from a VM and be careful. It starts by asking for confirmation twice, and once accepted, runs the notepad with the following message. From there, it can browse things on the internet like how to remove a virus, Bouncy body download free, Facebook hacking tool free download, no virus working 2016, and more. <laughs> After some time, memes will move the cursor, show pop-ups and random icons, making a tunnel effect and more visual annoyances that make the PC practically unusable. When you're trying to kill memes with the task manager, it'll show multiple random messages like, somebody once told me the memes are gonna roll me, before showing a blue screen of the... <laughs> Tier 4 Fork Bombs these are attacks that take up all the user's resources. I'm giving you an example, but never run it. Again, because of YouTube, I have to specify that everything in this video is presented with benign educational purposes. The commands you're seeing right now are classic examples of fork bombs. In summary, they call themselves and create a background subprocess that will create another one and so on, forcing your computer to freeze and reboot. In these cases, they don't do a lot of damage because is just the memory was overloaded. You can easily kill the root process to stop it, or prevent it to an extent by limiting resources to other users with the command you limit. Fork bombs don't necessarily have to be a command in an OS. They could even be a bug or more graphical, draining the resources quicker, usually by spawning windows. This is the case of You Are an Idiot, a website that still exists, at least a recreation. It shows these small smiley faces, and if you click on any of them or press Ctrl, Alt, Delete, or F4, the page will override these keys and replace the action to spawn even more windows instead. Before you go and try it, because I know some of you will, this is cross-platform, as it is a very small JavaScript program, and depending on your browser, it could block the pop-ups or not. Some variations install malware, or more aggressive with the amount of spawned windows, contain shocking pictures, and more. Another more dangerous variation of this are seven bombs. These are just normal zip files and apply to any system, but once extracted, your OS will become extremely saturated. As it turns out, that small kilobyte-sized file actually contained petabytes, that is around millions of gigabytes. It's a titanic amount of information, even a high-end PC could not process that well, but in reality, most
most of these only have blank files, copied and recursively compressed. Some of them don't even need recursion to work and could include other malware. Just by themselves, the set bombs will not only make your PC very slow and consume your RAM, but they could also fill up your entire disk in a short amount of time and overheat your system. These SIPs shouldn't require an executable or a write permission because they're technically just being read. Zip bombs are really easy to make and it could be automated. Only accept files from trusted sources. Rootkit Named after the words root, the super user's name in most Unix-like systems and kit, as in a collection of software, I think you can already guess what they're capable of. Even though, don't be confused by the name, they could attack any system regardless of Unix-like or not. Once they have access to elevated permissions, they're able to access all information in the PC, changing passwords, stealing data, and downloading other malware. There are some that go too deep called bootkit and even managed to go before the operating system, replacing your bootloader with a modified one, like Black Lotus, flashing itself as part of the UFI. I'm not going to pretend to understand how they did any of this, but it is a reminder of being really careful when downloading any type of updates. For this entry, it's important to mention DRM implementations that could be considered a rootkit. If you don't know what that is, it stands for a digital Digital restriction. <laughs> I mean digital rights management, just not your rights. For example, have you ever wanted to take a screenshot in Netflix? Not necessarily with bad intentions, but it could be that something funny happened in your favorite show and you took a screenshot to send it to your friend. But when you look at it, it's black, when the show was clearly just fine. Well, that and many other artificial limitations are DRM, and it is often one level above the user, mainly in phones and browsers with the objective of, unsuccessfully, stopping users from distributing unauthorized copies, even if they bought them and it wasn't a subscription. This was the case of the Sony BMG Rootkit. In 2005, they would use the auto-run feature enabled by default in Windows that lets you choose the behavior of external drives. In this case, it would install the XCP Rootkit the moment you inserted that CD, as an attempt to stop users from ripping it. There was no notification about this and the user could not remove it, consuming a lot of resources in the background. But the geniuses at Sony made an accidental vulnerability by hiding all of the files that started with the sys prefix, leading to Trojans like Preplybot to take advantage of this and disguise themselves more successfully. The worst part is that even if you try to remove the rootkit, it could potentially be illegal as you would be bypassing the RM, another dystopian thing to worry about today. And I'm pretty sure Sure that didn't stop users from ripping their CDs. I mean, it was the 2000s, and we're going full circle here. Niche malware. Ilk Cloner was the first virus for the Apple II computer, but it was harmless, made as a hidden prank that got triggered when you played a game 50 times. What could be considered as the first harmful example was the Worm Leap for the formerly called OS X. After receiving a compressed tar file from iChat that contained a program disguised as leaked pictures of the next OS X update, it'll open a terminal that asks for your password in order to be run, and if Given, it will use Spotlight to find your four most recently used apps, changing their permissions and adding an extended attribute. Basically just metadata, like the one you could find in MP3s but for all files. In this case, it is a property with the name of Oompa and Loompa as the value. That's how it knows what apps are affected and where the alternative name for this worm comes from. A persistent copy of Leap will be saved to slash TMP and sent to all your Bonjour iChat contacts. As for Linux, the first virus was Stayog, I guess that's how it's pronounced, written in assembly by a group known as Vlad, residing in memory and infecting any executable, exploiting multiple vulnerabilities to become root. Even if really rare, there have been some more desktop-focused Linux malware, like Evil Gnome, discovered in July 2019 and getting its name from the attempt to disguise itself as a Gnome extension, but turns out it is a self-extraction 
extractable file. Yes, those exist. Storing its contents to the cache.folder slash gnome software slash gnome shell extensions, adding a cron job that will run every minute, with the rest of the files being key loggers, an audio recorder, and a screenshot taker. Pretty intrusive, and yeah, thinking about it, also a real malicious shell extension could do similar things, as they have access to window management, clipboard content, and core aspects of the UI. So be careful with whatever it is that you download, even if it's a GNOME or Plasma add-on, read the reviews, check the permissions, the source code if necessary, and if you're running GNOME, install only via the extensions manager. And while Unix-like systems are usually more secure than Windows, with things like default permissions, ownership, and application permissions in macOS, and Flatpak in desktop Linux, still, don't blindly rely on the smaller market share because some hackers have started to keep these systems in mind too. Hardware vulnerabilities these are usually worse because they cannot be fixed, or at least, not completely with a software update. You've probably heard about Spectre and Meltdown. They exploited a behavior in CPUs called speculative execution. Kinda sounds like a metal album I listen to, but it is instead when the processor tries to guess what it needs to do first. If it's doing the right thing, you could save some processing power, and if it's wrong, it does the other thing instead. But because this works to a kernel level, somebody with bad intentions could make the CPU run code it shouldn't and get very sensitive information like passwords. The worst part is that basically most processors from the past 20 years are affected by this, including Intel, AMD, Apple, and ARM. Fortunately, some patches have been made but require separating the kernel and user processes more, meaning that in most cases, there is going to be a significant performance decrease and it is a partial fix. Speaking more about firmware, in 2018, a copy of a legitimate ASUS UFI update was modified and uploaded, even managing to sign it with the official keys from ASUS and keeping the same size, so checking hashes would be irrelevant because they would have been different either way. This attack, called Shadow Hammer, is believed to have affected around a million computers, but interestingly enough, they were targeting specifically 600 computers with hard-coded MAC addresses, until Kaspersky found it in 2019. If you have an ASUS motherboard, you can check if you're one of those targets in the website I'll leave below. You likely want to clear CMOS and update the UFI, but do it whenever you're sure that your power source and network are stable, because a wrong update, depending on the motherboard, could be irreversible and prick it, making your computer unusable. Don't ask how I know. Finally, both Intel and AMD contain microcontrollers within their processors, the management engine and platform security processor respectively. Both have been criticized for running a mini, proprietary operating system that handles very sensitive data, leading to some people calling this spyware at the hardware level. Regardless of the veracity of this claim, it is true that it runs at a deeper level than the OS and UFI. Both of these companies are usually very good when it comes to open sourcing their drivers and technologies, so it is a little bit weird that they decided to not open source this. I can see why it could be security by obscurity, but that didn't prevent them from having many security vulnerabilities that could be used to install rootkits, steal encryption keys, and run external code. You can disable them in some cases, but for most CPUs made in the past decade, if possible, it's very hard and could have some security implications, unfortunately. Quantum computers could break encryption. Encryption is not perfect. It can be cracked eventually, but it relies on how long it would take for it to be solved. In most cases, with a good algorithm and passphrase, we're talking about centuries, millennia, or literal millions of years. And by then, you've likely already changed the password, and we're all going to be dead too. However, there is a type of supercomputers that have taken relevancy in the past years. Quantum computers. They work in a similar way to the concept of quantum mechanics, 
that I'm clearly not an expert at, but the people that are at MIT explained in this article how they could theoretically break 2048-bit RSA encryption in 8 hours, ridiculously short for something this complex. This opens a very frightening scenario where governments and corporations that have quantum computers at their disposal take this as an advantage to decrypt sensitive data. And I'm not just referring to your messages and personal info, but to military and medical information of other countries. You probably shouldn't worry as of now, as the same article mentions that in order to do something like this, we need a 20 million qubits quantum computer, and the most powerful one we have is of 70 qubits, so it's still some years away. Some organizations like Google have already started to promote the use of post-quantum encryption. Fileless malware this is an increasingly popular type of malware. Until now, all of them had as a common pattern the presence of malicious files. But this time, you don't even need any external executable to damage a system because it exploits core system components to be the ones to cause damage. Often running malicious code store in memory, this is actually how most malware began before hard drives. While that means rebooting the computer is going to get rid of it, even if you do it within a couple of minutes, it could have done a lot of things by then like spreading through your network or downloading another type of malware, making it very hard to notice and find the perpetrators because any evidence is going to be permanently wiped. One of the first instances of this could have been the code red worm, as it didn't download any file, just took advantage of a vulnerability in the Microsoft Internet Protocol server, exploiting a buffer overflow, basically storing a value longer than what that variable could hold, so it is replaced by whatever the attacker wants, being able to hack any infected servers displaying the message you're seeing right now and later launching a DDoS attack to the White House's website. And that was in 2001. Imagine what they could pull off today. Physical security standing for quick response, QR codes are here to stay, and even though they're pretty comfortable and not inherently bad, only being able to store around 4,000 text characters, they can be used for malicious purposes. A new type of attack has risen ever since the pandemic, being pretty easy to do. An attacker places a QR code in public, often covering up legitimate code, and once scanned, it can forward that device to a phishing website or initiate an automatic download. USBs are all one handy little thing we all use, and it has become popular to leave them in public places, like parking lots, known as a drop attack. Curious people will plug them to see what they have, and you very likely won't like it. Some disguise themselves as a USB keyboard, requiring no additional drivers in almost all operating systems, being able to do something like opening a terminal and running some commands by itself. The possibilities are limitless, and in a matter of seconds, devices like like the rubber ducky can do things like these, but you don't necessarily need that in some cases. Like I've mentioned before, somebody could put an auto run script that executes malicious code and deletes itself in a matter of seconds, and you would never know. Even if no malware is present, there could be instances of pen drives having highly illegal material that could be very disturbing and get you in a lot of trouble. Some other dangerous devices to look out for are USB killers. These are able to generate an electrical charge so powerful that fries your battery and could potentially explode. Remember to also have more traditional means of physical security. In the case of information and valuable possessions, a physical vault is going to be useful, and a paper shredder can help you to get rid of important documents. Covering your webcam with a piece of tape can be better than no cover at all, some of them including a privacy shutter nowadays, but if possible, try to get a device that not only only covers the camera but blocks the hardware connection directly. A Faraday bag could be helpful to block absolutely all wireless connections like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, and cellular. Also, look for hidden cameras in hotels. Some can't even be seen easily by the human eye, so use your phone. I know it could sound like paranoid levels of security, but people in certain countries might need this, and it's always good to know prevention measures. Deep Web 
The mystifying deep web is essentially what search engines don't index. For example, if you look up in Google or another search engine, Gmail, you'll find a lot of search results. That is what search engines index, often called the clear net. In this example, the deep web would be your specific email inbox, as you cannot find that one by searching on the internet. Same goes for banking information, private videos on YouTube, and you get the idea. It's not necessarily something bad. When most people people say deep web, they're usually referring to the dark web, accessible by the Tor browser, standing for The Onion Router. This is an open source fork of Firefox created by the US government. And this is no conspiracy, it's literally what happened. Every computer connects to the Tor network, working as nodes and volunteers. Your traffic goes through many of these nodes, always encrypted and decentralized, making it very hard to track down, perfect for some more illicit type of businesses and actions, even though it does have its legitimate uses, like circumventing censorship. Even Facebook has its extremely ironic Don Onion counterpart. It has increased in popularity in the past few years, mainly by YouTubers that make fake videos about ordering really creepy things from the dark web. But there is some reality to this. It is true that some things like substances have been traded here, creating multi-million dollar websites like the defunct Silk Road. His creator got caught when suspicions were confirmed, as he used the same username when he promoted his dark web business in the early days and when he asked for programming help in a forum, giving his full name and email. Seems like the bad reputation also comes from other websites that host content including conspiracy theories, alleged leaked documents being the ones from WikiLeaks at least partially confirmed, real leaked information from people, instructions for dangerous things, hitmen scams and content involving vulnerable people. I apologize for the censoring, but I'm trying to stay within the guidelines. The whole myth blurred the lines and I guess some of it began as a meme, becoming later a creepypasta. It introduces the more fictional concept of the Mariana's web. In reference to the Mariana Trench, the deepest point on earth, it supposedly gets harder to access it the lower you go, with some exaggerations saying that at the lower levels, you would need to be a genius in quantum mechanics mechanics and so. Being able to find their sensitive government information, Tesla's inventions, the location of the Atlantis, alien footage, and more. There is also the rumor of so-called red rooms, a website where you see a person have the worst time of their life via streaming. Donators could participate in this by giving instructions. Fortunately, this is very likely fake, as the Tor network is known for being really slow. It's like if you used multiple VPNs ends and it just wouldn't work. But honestly, I would worry way more about the clear net than the dark web. I bet it's not that different. There is only so much moderation a person in AI can do, so be careful out there. Ashley Medicine Data Breach Created in 2008, this is a dating website with the infamous slogan of Life is short, have an affair. You know where this is going. The users of this platform faced their worst nightmare when in 2015, the information of around 30 million users was leaked in the form of multiple data dumps containing names, passwords, addresses, phone numbers, and banking information. It is not clear how many of these are actually real, as the dating site does not ask for email confirmation, being prone to a lot of bots that the leaked confirmed, with 90 to 95 percent of real active accounts being men. The company also lied about their policy of deleting your account if you paid. The information was still saved there. The consequences were pretty bad because aside of the obvious, many people were shamed and at least one passing has been confirmed explicitly related to this incident. This and other data breaches like the 2014 iCloud breach remind us the importance of cybersecurity and that we shouldn't rely this much on third parties. After all, cybercrime seemed to be the future of illegal activities. It's worth thinking it twice. You probably do have something to hide. Horror malware. 
I had a hard time looking up more real pieces of horror malware. Some of them fall under the lost media and creepypasta territory, but I'm only giving you things that seem to have some truth to them. The most obvious examples are this family of horror malware, including the Annabelle, Jigsaw, and Red Eye ransomware. It seems like around 2017, it became very popular to use horror or controversial figures like that German person or anonymous that I doubt would do something like this to a random person, but it's to add a more psychological effect that could potentially increase the chances of a successful attack. The source code could have been leaked or was offered as a ransomware service, because they look practically the same, just switching the background. Some variations are more aggressive and can even start deleting files as time goes on. In the case of Red Eye, it seems like it doesn't encrypt the files, just overrides all the files with zeros, acting as some sort of wiper, with almost unrecoverable data, likely regardless of payment. This one also appears to have been real. Igor I.O. was an intentional typo squatting website. As back in that time, the real game Agar I.O. was becoming very popular among people of all ages. However, Igor I.O. presented a screamer of Jeff the Killer that couldn't be closed with an excessive amount of flashing lights and a loud metallic sound that you could think is an obvious troll attempt to trigger seizures in photos sensitive people, and according to this Reddit post, it was successful at hurting someone. Regardless of whether the post is saying the truth or not, other users' testimonies and info I found could confirm the existence of this website. As many other flash malware or scam websites, it's likely lost due to its shutdown in 2015 and the death of Adobe Flash on December 31st, 2020. Gary's Mod is a 2006 sandbox game, and as the name suggests, mods play a big part in this, adding more items and features. The GMM virus is believed to have been a 2009 mod from GarysMod.org that showed a jump scare of the G-Man character from the Half-Life series. It could also open shock websites, remap key bindings, and more. There have been other real G-Mod confirmed malware, so I think it's likely for this to have existed. Let me know your opinion below. Finally, let's talk about Sad Satan. This is a real horror game, allegedly from the dark web. It doesn't matter where it truly came from because the content is very disturbing either way, containing extremely graphic content that is very likely straight up legal. There are clean versions, but these can even contain a lot of malware that according to some is able to get out of virtual machines, and the so-called clean version seems to be pretty much lost. Do not download this. It's not worth the risk at all. So in 2013, journalists at The Guardian gather in a hotel room in Hong Kong to meet the now ex-NSA contractor Edward Snowden. They didn't know it back then, but with the release of the first article claiming the US government collected every day millions of information from the telecom provider Verizon, starting a series of revelations considered to be one of the biggest ones in the US history, confirming one of those things we all know and don't like to remember. In that we very likely shouldn't have normalized. We're being spied on, even if you're not a potential threat, and it doesn't matter if you're not American. Other reports state that the agency intercepts fiber optic cables, communications from other regions like China, the EU, and Latin America, and by 2014, they stored around 200 million SMS messages. This is only a fraction of the alleged thousands of documents Snowden had, but he still had to trade his job at the NSA in Hawaii for exile in Russia to evade the potential 30 years of prison he could face returning to the US. I recommend you to watch most of his interviews. He says some interesting things and gives some great cybersecurity advice. Thinking about all the surveillance that could have been happening over these 10 years, I think being slightly paranoid is probably not exaggerated. John McAfee's final years. John McAfee is known for creating the antivirus named after him. Ever since 2012, his public life has been surrounded in controversy and legal issues because his neighbor was found without signs of life and with a bullet wound, causing McAfee to run away to Guatemala, stating that he, quote unquote, maybe said 15 words to him in the five years he lived there, but also that he thought his neighbor probably poisoned his dog. When police
police found him, he was allowed to go back to Miami. He wanted to run for president in 2016, starting to promote cryptocurrencies and according to The Verge, charging $105,000 per tweet to promote coin offerings. In late 2020, he was arrested in Spain, accused of tax evasion and money laundering, facing up to 30 years in prison, but shortly after, he was found in his cell and he had taken his own life. WannaCry was infecting an enormous amount of computers, and it was only a matter of time until they got to hospitals, one of the last places where you would want ransomware preventing your machines from saving the lives of other people, but it happened. And according to this report by the UK's National Audit Office, around 19,000 appointments were cancelled, and many patients had to travel further, including the accident and emergency departments. And in these situations, you don't want to take any chance because one literal second could be the difference between life and death. Aaron Schwartz. He was a genius. At 13, he made the Info Network, a sort of predecessor to Wikipedia. At 14, he co-founded RSS. At 19, he was one of the co-founders of Reddit. He was also very involved in preventing the Stop Online Piracy Act that could have made it easier for the US government to shut down any website accused of copyright infringement. He also contributed to Creative Commons, Markdown, and the Tor Network. In 2011, he entered to the MIT's Building 16, connecting a refurbished Daiso laptop to one of the servers in a restricted utility closet, and began copying millions of academic journals, costing usually thousands of dollars in yearly subscriptions. It was all revealed later due to a hidden security camera, and was found when he was riding his bike, intercepted by the police and the Secret Service, with the possibility of being in federal prison for up to 35 years. In early 2013, he was given a sentence, and after losing a great part of his money on the trial, as well as being devastated by the result and the fact that he was planning to marry his girlfriend before this, ended up costing his life. After his death, Anonymous hacked two MIT websites, replacing them with tributes to Aaron, leading to many other attacks and other hackers releasing scientific articles too as a tribute. I don't want to end this entry too dark, so I'm just going to share with you this quote, because I think it summarizes the purpose of this video perfectly. Be curious, read wily, try new things. What people call intelligence just boils down to curiosity. Cyber b -b 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 I've been making iceberg videos for more than two years now, and I don't think there is anything so realistic and so dreadful before. I'm speaking about cyber warfare, a concept that is not even far-fetched and just the reality that we have barely managed to dodge. Stanislav Petrov was a soldier in the Soviet Union back in the Cold War. One of the nuclear attack warning systems raised the alarm. He only had 10 minutes to take one of the hardest decisions in all human history. It was either send an attack back that would very likely mean a global conflict of nuclear proportions or ignore it and face the risk of being erased forever. Trusting his gut, he chose the latter, ignoring the alarm that turns out had a false positive, avoiding one of the biggest and probably the last conflict the human race could have suffered. But this is just the beginning, an ongoing trend. Think about all that's possible with the latest technology. I wouldn't be surprised if in the coming decades we start to see more psychological malware. Imagine a country launching a stealthy piece of malware against another one that starts to manipulate the behavior and thoughts of the citizens, with subtle things like suggestions. What if it starts to make random searches or delete files that you were sure existed, but now you can't remember? They wouldn't even know why they do what they're doing, what they like, what they buy, what they believe. If we start to see implants in the brains of people, what could stop a bad program from introducing nocebo effects to distract them more, make them more aggressive or depressed? Sounds exaggerated, but what is true right now is that we've already seen malware that attacks public infrastructure and in the worst case scenario, nuclear plants like Stuxnet, a worm that is believed to have gotten to an Iran nuclear plant via a USB pen drive. 
with, manipulating the speed of the machinery enough for it to damage them to an extent. It was fortunately not as bad as it could have been. But what if, as you're watching this video, many more malware that we'll never know about is being developed and attacks in the moment that you least expected, without giving you a second to realize what's happening.